So let's get real practical here. It's a concept we call peace sower teams. And it's that passage I mentioned a little bit earlier, James 3.18, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. There's a sowing, there's a nurturing, and then there's a harvesting. And so we want to talk about is how can you delegate to people uh, this responsibility to carry part of this load? And, you know, referring back to Exodus uh, 18, uh, Moses had led the people of Israel out of Egypt. They had crossed the Red Sea and they're out in the desert. And every day he was setting up his judgment seat and all the people were coming to him with their complaints. You know, his sheep, you know, came over and were on my ground and his camel did this. And so and so all the conflicts would come up with these stiff necked people, the nation of Israel. And every day Moses spent hours and hours and hours resolving conflicts. And his his father-in-law, Jethro, came to visit one day and was watching his son-in-law solve all the problems of the whole nation. He finally said, you're an idiot, Moses. This is crazy. You're going to exhaust yourself trying to solve all these things. It'll just wear you out. You need to identify godly people in the body and train them as judges, peacemakers, and then delegate to them the responsibility for dealing with most of these issues. You create what he called judges over groups of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000. It's an appellate system. And he says only the hard cases should ever get up to you. So if you apply that principle and then you look at all the other passages in the Bible about training and building up the body of Christ and delegating and using gifts, it's basically that every church or ministry should develop, number one, teach the basic peacemaking principles to everybody in the group. Everybody in the congregation and ministry should have basic peacemaking, relational wisdom training. So the principles are there and they're living them out one-on-one -on -one, day to day. But then you identify other people who are mature, who are respected, that you take to a higher level of training on coaching and mediation, who are available if some people can't resolve something, they can come to that other person and say, hey, we've got a disagreement about something, we've tried to talk it through, but we still can't really come to agreement, would you be willing to sit down and work with us? And so they come to these people, and if it's a really big issue, maybe it has to go up to the pastor, maybe it has to go to the HR director or the ministry vice president, whatever, it can work its way up, but the vast majority of these things should be worked out within the body itself. So the basic structure of a peacemaker, a peace sower team, is you promote individual or group study on the basic principles of relational wisdom and peacemaking, just how do we love God with all our heart, love our neighbors, ourselves, and live out all the peacemaking. And then some of those people are then trained as, as trainers, basically presenters. And a famous American theologian named D.L. Moody years and years ago had a great insight. He said, Christians leak. Christians leak. We can give them great training today and they forget it in 24 hours. And they definitely forget it in three months. We, we, we forget so much of what we learn. And so you have to be constantly refreshing people's memory, reminding people of these things over and over again. And then also as new people come into your organization, your church or your ministry, you need to bring them up to speed. So you should have some people in your organization that are specifically dedicated to teaching and training these principles, keeping them in front of your people. And that could be like staff devotions. If you have a weekly staff devotion, you could devote some of those to sort of a refresher about the four G's of peacemaking or the four promises of forgiveness or the concept of relational wisdom. You can just use some devotionals to, to refresh the, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Good, thanks for the reminder. And then you can also train people um, in the organization, the church or ministry as coaches, the ones that people come to and just say, I need some advice on how to deal with this issue. You get some advice and sends them back out to work with those issues. And then you also have some people you could train as conciliators, the ones who sit down with two parties and help work through those issues. Now, make a note of that URL at the bottom of the page, rw360.org slash PST, that stands for Peace Sower Team. 
If you go to that web page, you'll see a very detailed um, framework for this whole concept of a piece of our team. How you can do it. Now we're still, we are we are actually upgrading a lot of our former training on the coaching and mediation part. We we just recently filmed a new peacemaker course that's in the editing process now. And so the uh, individual study and group study on peacemaking will be available, Lord willing, this summer. And then we're releasing the coaching and the mediation training at our, our national conference this fall. Um, so that training, and we're going to make everything available online. So you don't have to come to, to the United States to get this training. It'll all be available online. Um, one of the things that I encourage you to, re, uh, to, to use in this material is to use these concepts for witnessing and evangelism. We actually developed a secular version of relational wisdom. We'll do the same thing for peacemaking. Um, and that secular version is something we're taking into um, businesses, public schools. Um, I've taught those principles to United States senators and congressmen. I've taught them in the US military's Pentagon, our, our top military uh, headquarters in Washington, DC. I've taken that secular version into those settings. And we basically, what we do is we take the Bible verses out, the explicit Bible citations out. We make some very minor changes in the rest of what's there. And the main change is on that paradigm, that six part paradigm that has God awareness and God engagement in the, in the biblical version instead has values awareness and values engagement. So we're not specifically imposing a Christian worldview in that audience, but we're leaving it up to values that they're aware of and how they're living them out. But the, here's the great thing. Because it's completely secular, it's been, it's been approved for continuing professional education for public school teachers, for healthcare workers, for lawyers, for counselors, for social workers, so a lot of people in secular professional settings can go through that training and learn those principles. And the courses are designed where there's crossover links that anyone going through the secular version has an opportunity to see a faith-based version of that concept. 32 opportunities to click on a link that slides over to a basically a biblical presentation. So it's in many ways, it's, it's stealth evangelism. We wanna get into secular settings and give people the opportunity to encounter the gospel. Um, and what happens anytime I do this, for example, if I'm brought into a business to do training, um, I'll lay out the secular version, talk about values, how worldviews give rise to belief, give rise to values, and they direct our behavior. So we develop this, this continuum. And I say, is there anybody here in this room who has undergone a major worldview change in your life? And every time I've asked that question, every single time, somebody raises their hand and says, well, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you my experience. Man, I, I was raised in, you know, in a home where everybody looks out for themselves. I got married. It was a disastrous marriage. I was selfish. I had a terrible temper. I was drinking. Uh, I was on the brink of a divorce. My kids didn't like me. I'd actually been fired from a couple of jobs. My life was a mess. And then a friend talked to me about Jesus Christ. And it took me a while to really understand, but I became a Christian and he totally changed my life. So it's not me standing up at the front trying to preach the gospel to this room full of employees. It's a fellow employee giving a really great opportunity to share the gospel with his coworkers. And we've never had any backlash on that. It's just, it's his experience. So part of what you could do, most churches and ministries want to grow. And if you would like in your church, for example, to reach out into your community and serve your community, bringing a lot of these principles to, to the people in your community, um, and even by common grace, non-Christians can apply these wisdom principles beneficially. You know, we want, we want non-Christians to drive the speed limit. They don't have to be saved to see the benefit of driving the speed limit, obeying laws. But as you train a team of people in your church, and part of their role is going out into the community. We've got one, one of uh, the instructors we trained living in the Midwest. 
He's gone into real estate companies, surgical companies, police departments, military bases. He's, he said, this is our church growth strategy. He's going out into all these secular settings, teaching the values material. It always turns into a conversation about a worldview of a Christian worldview at some point. People find out he's a Christian. And he said, every time I do this, the next Sunday, there's people walking in the back door of our church who were in that seminar during the week. He said, that's how we're adding people to our church. We're going out, sharing the wisdom principles, and they're coming to meet Christ. So that's one of the benefits of this whole concept. Um, so let me give you some practical takeaways now, what you can do. Um, <clears throat> 1 Timothy 4.15 says, practice these things, immerse yourselves in them so that all may see your progress. So God calls us, first of all, to learn and practice, immerse ourselves in what he teaches in his word, pray for his Holy Spirit to help us to put off, be made new in the attitude of our minds, put on the new nature of Christ and live it out in a way that other people will be watching us. They would be seeing our progress and they would say, I want to learn how to do what you're doing. Now, I don't think anybody should be doing that more than a pastor or ministry leader. I mean, we should be inspiring our people. And again and again in the New Testament, leaders are exhorted to follow the example of Christ so that others would follow their example. So we should be setting an example as church leaders. And a couple of ways you can begin doing that is that one URL, the, the 20 ways, is the much more detailed article that covers everything I've talked about today, but in a lot more detail. If you want to dig into any of these concepts and be more biblically rigorous. And then if you still like what you're seeing is make a note of that URL for our online academy, just rwacademy.org. And write down that coupon. It's going to be good for two months, 60 days, that you can start the course. You can take a year to, to finish it. You don't have to finish it in two months, but it's only going to be good for two months. And it's just ELF 2021. If you go to our online course, use that coupon, you have free access to it. It's normally $49. Um, and you can go through the course yourself. It's, you know, it's like Acts 1711, where... It says the Bereans were noble people because they listened eagerly to what Paul had to say, but then they went home and they searched the scriptures to see if what he said was true. And that course will give you the opportunity to search the scriptures to see if the concepts we're teaching are true. And if they are, then you can start taking these things to your church. And you'll see at the bottom of your handout some other URLs for uh, some other training options, how to take this into other settings. You'll see the course um, listed there again. You can find that uh, that piece or team uh, concept spelled out as well. And as we develop these principles and get more and more of them online, you can figure out ways to bring these concepts in into your churches and ministries.